Bill Watcott. Welcome to today's issues. Thank you for having me. Well, we're very happy to have you with us today. Um, tell us about your story. We want we want to talk about the book, but we want to. Your book is the story of a very rough beginning in life from where you were to where you are today. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I was certainly uh, brought up in a, in a non-Christian environment and uh, was certainly a product of, uh, of the state uh, that I know uh, your program often, often has to deal with. Um, I was brought up in foster homes where sexual permissiveness and atheism was, was pretty much the norm, and I certainly, I certainly, um, you know, uh, you know, they basically imbued those, those values. Now, um, you know, uh, I guess I became a drug addict and, uh, certainly a sexual deviant, uh, at a young age, and I was, I was very violent. Uh, but at 18, uh, thanks be to some Christians who, who shared the gospel with me over those years, the few that I ran into, um, I, I came to Christ, and then uh, certainly, uh, I guess you can Google my name and find out the pro-life ministry that I've, that I've uh, taken on since then. Bill, in the beginning, uh, in your growing up years, you were in, in and out of the foster homes and so on. Before you came to Christ, did you have any opinion about Christianity at all, or was it simply irrelevant to your life? Uh, I didn't respect Christianity. I remember at 14 uh, going into a Catholic church and drinking their their holy water as sort of a a joke of some sort, you know, where people go in to cross themselves, they put their finger in and then do the sign of the cross. Uh, I was in the lineup and, and drank it so that the people behind me couldn't uh, couldn't cross themselves. And I remember once crashing a Pentecostal church and getting up on their stage with my glue bag and thought it was great when I got thrown out. It was a storefront church. Um, so, so, so there certainly was a lack of respect, uh, but my knowledge of Christianity was very minimal. I did not know even the most basic of Bible verses. Um... And, um, and, and yeah, so for the most part, it was, Christianity was, was irrelevant. It, it never occurred to me to go to church on a Sunday, for instance. And somewhere in there, Bill, you were, and I, I'm just looking at the table of contents of the book. You, it, chapter 6 says simply, in jail, comma, again and again. Where does the jail part, uh, the prison part, figure into your life? Uh, the first time I was sent to an institution was at the age of 14. And uh, I think when I wrote that chapter, I was already a Christian, albeit not well catechized. And uh, that was kind of a breaking point where, where I actually realized I was a loser and really had to humble myself and get, get right with God. And God worked out a few circumstances where that would come about. Uh, but from 14 to 20, I'd say I spent uh, pretty much close to five of those years, at least four and a half, in, in prison of one form or another. And at, at some point in here, move, let's move the story along just a little bit, because I want to get to what you're doing now, but n- not quite there yet. So what was the turning point? whether it was in your early 20s or after you were out of prison, that, that began that begin to move your life in a meaningful, a different direction? There are, of course, there's, there's, it's, it's easy to have one defining moment. I guess in my case, there was a few defining moments. Um, one was when I was 18, and I just took a, an amazing... An amazing amount of LSD, 25 hits. I, I just wanted to, to really end my life, or at least end my, my ability to think. And uh, I nearly died. I nearly uh, jumped off a bridge, and I, I believe it was a miracle. Uh, a police officer showed up, and it was about 3 in the morning, I think, and he just got me by the back of my neck before, before I was going to go over. And uh, that sort of cured me of atheism. And that put me on a road where I started thinking I had to find God, even though I really didn't know how. Uh, then I think when I was in that 
chapter six, uh, you know, in jail again and again. I was not even trying to go to jail and wound up in jail. And then I accidentally called on a Golden Gloves boxer who, who, who would have cleaned my clock very, very quickly. And I really had to humble myself and admit that I didn't want to fight him. And it was my mouth that kind of did it. And, and there was a lot of prayer that went into that. And I got out of that unscratched, uh, which for the prison I was in, it was a very violent one. Uh, that was a miracle in and of itself. And then I guess there was a point, there was a point, uh, a few months after that, when I was broke and tempted to steal, and I put my hand on a car door to steal, and it was just like the Lord was saying, because by now I have been reading the Bible every day. It's like you got two paths you can go, and I just said, no, I'm going to trust the Lord. Even though I'm broke, I'm, I'm going to try to find a job and do, do things the right way. And I think I was about 20 then, and, and that, that, that's when things turned forever. Maybe I was 21 by then. Talking to Bill Watcott, W H uh, A T C O T T, uh, author of the book and it's his story. It's called "Born in a Graveyard: One Man's Transformation from a Violent Drug Addicted Criminal into Canada's Most Outspoken Family Values uh, Activist." And uh, where can people find out more about your story and about this book, uh, Bill? Uh, well, certainly my website uh, www dot free north america. .ca, and then my publisher has a website, BillWatcott.com, where, where my book is being offered. Again, why the passion for the pro-life cause? Yeah, you know, it didn't seem that that would be uh, the calling for me. Uh, certainly, I was not at all pro-life when I was younger. Um, I think part of it was that I did get into nursing after I got out of prison, and, um, and, and I was certainly confronted with the abortion issue there. And, of course, I wanted to get into prison ministry, which just seemed like a natural fit. Now, uh, sadly, with uh, the advent of uh, socialist governments uh, here in Canada, I, I actually got my, uh, my uh, prison ministry through civil disobedience as well. Uh, but it just seemed that that was where my, my passion was. I remember seeing a lady under anesthesia who, um, you know, was crying, uh, I killed my baby, I killed my baby when I was in Humber Memorial Hospital, and nobody gave her pro-life counseling. It was just simply she knew that within herself when she was under sedation. Uh, there was just a number of experiences like that, and then I am kind of a, a stubborn guy, and, uh, and and so, so you know, in that sense, pro-life is a tough go, and it was easy for me to get into that, and 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 I had the psychological makeup to get into the fight. Mm. So, uh, um, your younger, I mean, who was an, Was there anybody that was a good positive influence on you uh, in your formative years? Were you on your own? Not really. No, no. Uh, certainly not when I was growing up. Um, I think my mother tried the best she could, but she was struggling with an alcohol demon herself. Uh, the foster homes were were all pretty negative influences. Uh, the first positive influence I had was when I got sent to this uh, correctional center that was managed by the Salvation Army. And the fellow's name was Bob Tuners, and he had asked me, uh, when are you going to accept Jesus Christ? And at the time, I kind of persecuted him and uh, caused a lot of trouble for him. Uh, but his words sort of stuck with me. And uh, likewise, there was a Pentecostal fellow, Paul Catania, who tried to share the gospel with me. And somewhere at the age of 17, I realized these guys had something I didn't have. And I, I would ponder on that just a, just a little bit. And, and then it came back to me more when I was ready to give my life to Christ in the graveyard. Uh, but no, there wasn't really a positive influence until until I met those Christians, and I only had a little bit of interaction with them, and a lot of that in, interaction was confrontational, but even that, even that was still something. So who actually led you to the Lord? <clears throat> I would say Bob Tuners planted a seed, because he did tell me about Christ, although he eventually had to send me from his woodworking shop, because I'd break into the thing and try to sniff his plastic wood. Uh, then I would say that there was a couple uh, Christians who picked me up when I was hitchhiking. Uh, 
And I never did give my life in front of any of them. Uh, but I was all by myself in a, in a graveyard with a glue bag on my face when I did finally come to Christ. With a what on your face? A glue bag, sniffing glue. I wasn't even oh, looking sni- for God. Oh, I got you. I got sniffing glue. Well, I never heard that. I've heard a lot of crazy testimonies, but I've never heard one like that before. Uh, so you're in a no, graveyard. I just can't take a lot of credit for it, can I? No, no, you can't. Uh, so you're in a graveyard sniffing glue. And what happens? Did you hear an audible voice, or what happens there? Um, actually, actually, what happened? Uh, you thankfully, you probably know nothing about sniffing glue, and, and <laughs> clearly, I would recommend you never learn anything. It's a very potent uh, method of getting high. Uh, the two lane anacetone goes into your lungs, and these are industrial chemicals that are not meant for the human body. And I've been inhaling those things, and what those things do is they poison you, and they cause you to hallucinate, and indeed, uh, you get high. It's, it's, in my opinion, a lot more potent than conventional street drugs like heroin. Uh, you talking about, you, you're talking about like, like are you just talking about like Elmer's glue you use at school? No, 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 airplane glue, which is much more toxic. Okay, all right. I didn't think that, you know, yeah. that kind of glue was... Yeah, yeah, and the chemicals that, that, that destroy your brain and okay. cause you to hallucinate and check out of out of uh, reality are acetone and Tulane. Gotcha. For anyone out there who knows the chemical compositions of glue, gotcha. they'll know what I'm talking about. And, and this is not meant for the human body. It kills <laughs> you pretty quick. It'll kill you Who's if you do it enough, body? won't it? It'll kill you if you do it enough, won't it? Oh, absolutely, yeah. and I knew a few um, glue sniffers, and, and they all had permanent brain damage within a year. Wow. Uh, it's sort of a miracle that I even have an IQ or that I was able to finish nursing with honors. Uh, yeah. But uh, once Amen. again, I think I think that was the grace of God that my body and mind was preserved. Uh, anyways, on the day when I was trying to get high, I was completely homeless. Uh, sleeping either outside or in men's hostels. I was 18 years old. I did not have any friends. I had no contact with family. And I was one of these guys that you would see, only I was very young. I was much younger than them. But I I was like the ones that you might see in downtown Los Angeles, uh, just walking with a uh, shopping cart, you know, picking up bottles. I was kind of reduced to that, and I looked like that too. My, My shoes had big holes in them. I had glue all over my face, glue all over my pants. I stunk. I uh, didn't have any change of the clothes, so I just wear whatever clothes I was wearing for a long time. And in that state, I was trying to get high on glue just just to check out of my reality. And I was sitting in the graveyard sniffing, and and I believe it was the Holy Spirit. I can't prove it, but uh, I, I really believe it. Uh, there was basically a wall. Uh, that prevented me from inhaling those fumes I was talking to you about, inhaling the acetone and the Tulane, which makes you hallucinate. I couldn't inhale the, the fumes from the glue bag. What you do is you put the glue in a plastic bag and you start inhaling, and before you know it, you're drooling and hallucinating, and that's kind of where you want to go when you're in that sorry state. I was perfectly straight after my first tube. I had about 10 tubes on me, and I went through all 10 tubes trying to get high, and on the tenth tube, I was as straight as I am today, talking to you. I was I was perfectly lucid. There was I could not sniff the glue, and then I just started crying. And uh, you know, I was crying because I was bitter that I couldn't get high and check out of my sorry state. And then uh, that's when I looked at some some tombstones. And to give you a little bit of uh, background, when I was in prison, I was a fairly vociferous reader. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't fit the profile describing to you what I was, homeless at 18 and holes in my shoes and a high school dropout. But at that time, I could have talked to you about the political situation in just about any, any part of the world. I could have told you the capitals of any country. I had a lot of academic and, and history knowledge. I always had an interest in that stuff, and I read up a lot when I was in jail. And so I knew something, even though I didn't know anything about Christianity, I knew something that Canada was more of a Christian culture in the 19th century. And uh, this, this, this graveyard that I was in was quite old. There was a lot of grave tombstones from the 1870s and 1880s because uh, Windsor was an established city at that time, and that's where I was living on the streets. And uh, I thought to myself, when those people died, they were probably cleaner than me. And, uh, and that's when I got the revelation that I was a sinner, 
because, uh, you know, the, the, the foster homes and the social work system, they all taught me that as a victim and that I was entitled and that it was the government's job to uh, fix me and that, and that I wasn't really morally culpable for all the crimes that I committed. And I really believed all of that. I believed I was basically a good person. We got about one minute, Bill. Okay, and so so at that point, I realized that I was a sinner and just bawled my eyes out for two hours and, and confessed my sin to Christ. Wow. So a road to Damascus experience, basically, what you're talking pretty about. Pretty much, pretty much. In the yeah. sense that you were by yourself, and the Holy Spirit of God convicted you of your sin, and you turned to Jesus for salvation, and your life's not been the same since. Bill Watcott is our guest, has been our guest, uh, W-H-A-T-C-O-T-T, and you can go to his website for more information on his book. It's a very fascinating read about the story that he shared with us today of his conversion, his life. His, uh, it's called Born in a Graveyard, and it's BillWatcott.com, W-H-A-T-C-O-T-T. Hey, Bill, thanks for sharing your testimony with us, and we appreciate your time today and wish you the best. Thank you. God bless you. All right, you too. Ray? It's been a great day, Tim. Hey, what a way to end it, too. Yeah, that's a that's a. When he says born in a graveyard, that's not a metaphor. He really means it. That's true. That's right. All right, folks, uh, straight ahead, the Bible teaching program of Dr. David Jeremiah called Turning Point. And then the news and then on with your day here on AFR, and uh, we shall see you back here tomorrow.